Well, we've been talking th during these two evenings about being future ready. And now I'm going to talk about the final judgment. And we have a text, and it is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. If you'd like to follow that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, I've just talked to you briefly about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what happens, of course, at the second coming is that we are resurrected from the dead. And believers receive their resurrection body, which is like the glorious body, the glorified body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, we're told clearly about that in Scripture. Now, we don't quite understand what sort of resurrection bodies the unbeliever will have, except that they will have them, but very little detail is given about that. And of course, some Christians will be still alive when the Lord comes. Um, they will be caught up to, to meet the Lord in the air, as will, of course, the resurrected saints. And so we will meet each other in the air and we'll be forever with the Lord. But there is the final judgment which follows that second coming. And on that, the Bible is clear. Uh, in, in Britain, we have politicians who keep saying it, it is absolutely clear this and it is absolutely clear that. Um, you, you don't need to use the word absolutely. It is clear, and the Bible is clear about the last judgment. Um, even in the book of Psalms, written a thousand years before Christ, there are clear, clear statements of, about, the last, about the last judgment. Um, let, me, let me read a couple of, of extracts from, from the book of Psalms. For example, at the end of Psalm 96, you have this written. He is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. And at the end of verse 98, uh, Psalm 98, for he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the people and uh, the world and the peoples with equity. It's, it's clear, clear, clear that there's going to be a judgment at the end of time. So when Solomon writes to his son in the book of Ecclesiastes, he, he closes his message to his son saying, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. And in the book of Daniel, 700 years or so before Christ came, we have this wonderful vision of the coming of Christ in chapter 7 of Daniel. And it's written, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A, thou a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened our lord jesus christ spoke about the judgment on many occasions and the nearer he got to his cross the clearer it became so when we come to matthew chapter 25 at the end of that chapter we have that very very clear parable about the sheep and the goats and all nations being gathered before christ at the end of time Paul talks about it. He talks about it here, obviously, in the verse which I've just read. He gives more detail in other places, especially 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And as you read through the book of Revelation, you keep coming to it again and again and again until you have the very plain statements of Revelation chapter 20. So the, the final judgment is clearly something that the Lord wants us to know about. It's also something, of course, of which every human conscience is convinced. There are one or two people, a few people in the world who stifle their conscience to the point where it doesn't work anymore. 
but with the vast majority of men and women, their own conscience tells them that there's going to be a there's going to be a judgment. Um, it's obvious um, when people talk about Hitler or Stalin or some of the dictators of of history who have caused the death not only of hundreds of thousands, but of millions. There's something inside the human conscience which says they're not going to get away with that. And when we hear of the appalling things which are done to, to children, every human conscience is saying uh, they're not going to get away with that. Everybody knows in their soul, in their heart of hearts, that there will be a judgment at the end of time. They may not wish to remember it, but they do, unless they stifle, of course, their consciences. We're told in Hebrews and Romans, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but approve of those who practice them. So th there are people who know that certain things are wrong, and they know that the judgment will call these things to account, but they still do them and they still approve of them in others. But it doesn't alter the fact that written into the human conscience is the knowledge that there will be a final judgment. And people don't like to think about it. I don't know what happens in Singapore, but I know what happens in Britain. A man or a woman goes to work, then they come home. The first thing they do is they walk across the room and they switch on either the television or they put on some background music because they don't want to be left alone with their own thoughts because their own thoughts will eventually go to death and to beyond death and written into their conscience somewhere is this thought of judgment which they don't want to remember they don't want to know and remember that they're going to be called to account for the way they've lived their day if they're bored in the evening what do they do well they switch on the tv and they they watch nonsense a great deal of the time because they don't want to be left with their own thoughts if they've got a hobby this is britain i'm talking about but i assume it's fairly similar where you are their hobby is probably something to do with sport. Uh, they love the, the, the excitement and the enthusiasm and what they call the atmosphere because they don't want to be left with their own thoughts. And if they're not involved in sport, then often they're involved in partying, as it's called, where people have wild behavior and uh, there's a lot of alcohol and maybe other drugs as well, which is dumbing people's sensibilities down because they don't want to be left alone with their own thoughts. Christians too sometimes forget about the judgment. I was uh, involved some years ago with a, a, a pastor who, who was too ill to continue preaching. So his church gave him two months off. But during that two months off, while he, he was supposedly recovering, he was offering his services to other churches so he could preach there. Now, that shows a lack of integrity. Why would a man do that? Because he's forgotten the judgment. Christians have very low standards sometimes of behavior. Now, you, you see that, by the way, many Christians drive um, their complete neglect of rules and especially speed limits. You see it sometimes when Christians declare their taxes to their government, um, that their honesty actually isn't complete. Um, there are all sorts of little things like that which betray the fact that although in lip service they believe in a judgment, that in the reality of their daily life they they don't really take it into consideration. You see that with the way people behave towards the Lord's day. The thought of taking a whole day out and living it for the Lord to some Christians seems a very odd thing to do, which it wouldn't, of course, if they had the judgment seat in their mind. And I know a lot of young Christians in Britain, mostly young married Christians, who have a terrific social life and they have many dozens of Christian friends, 
but they don't do anything at all to advance Christ's kingdom at all. Why, why would people live like that? Why would there be such a low standard of Christian living? Well, because they don't believe in the judgment, not really, really believe in it. And I'm praying in this brief message, you'll be struck by the, the certainty of the judgment. Uh, I'm, I'm praying that in some measure, you'll be struck by the terror of the judgment. I'm praying that you'll be struck by the wonder of the judgment and the impossibility of escaping it. And you, you don't need a clever sermon. What you need is just something plain and straight to the point. And so from this text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, here's four points to consider. So let's first of all read the verse again. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here's four things to, which I have to say. First of all, you will be there. The Christian will be there. The non-Christian will be there. That's plain from Matthew 25 and the sheep and the goats. There will be a great general judgment at the end of time. Everybody will be there. Christians will be there. And sometimes people say to me, oh, Pastor Elliot, I've, I've been forgiven my sins. The Lord has pardoned me. He's told me I'll, there'll be no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's true, of course. But you will be tried. Um, frankly, you want to be, don't you? You wouldn't want somebody in hell to say to the Lord, it's not fair. That man over there, that woman over there, they were never tried. You wouldn't want that accusation to be leveled against God, would you? You want to be tried, and you will be tried. And this is where you will thank God that you have been in a church where there's been good doctrinal teaching. There's nothing going to comfort you on the day of judgment more than the doctrine of double imputation. I hope you know what that is, but if you don't, I'm going to explain it now. My sins, all my sins, every one of my sins, my past sins, my present sins, my future sins, they've all been put to the account of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been imputed to him. They don't belong to him, but they've been considered to be his and he's borne the penalty of them. That's single imputation. So what's double imputation? Well, double imputation is this. His righteousness, his perfect life, his glorious life, which has been fleshed out through 33 and a half years on this earth, is imputed to me. It's considered, it's not mine, but it's considered to be mine. And so I am perfect in the eyes of God because Christ's righteousness is imputed to me and I'm considered in the sight of God to be as righteous as Jesus Christ is. And so by double imputation, I will be calm on the judgment seat and God will be seen to be just and he will be seen to be the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. And there is no chance that you will be condemned. And Paul, of course, makes that clear, clear, clear um, to the Romans. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect, seeing it is God who justifies? Who is he condemn who, who condemns? seeing it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Uh, it, in a courtroom, of course, you have a lawyer who speaks up for you. He's your advocate. And at that great final judgment, you'll have your advocate. 
and he will speak up the son of god will say all oh, that person's sins that believer's sins were put to my account and all my righteousness has been put to his account and god will be seen to be perfectly just and yet filled with love and grace the judgment seat from that point of view is going to be a wonderful day for christians we'll see all our guilt we'll see all our sin we shall give an account but we shall be justified and not condemned because of christ alone nothing in us whatever and if our reputation has been trashed during our life it will be rescued and if we've been persecuted we will be vindicated and if we've been neglected and pushed away by the world we will be seen of, to be the wisest of all men and women by god's grace it's going to be a, from that point of view it's going to be a wonderful day but in this first point nonetheless i must stress you will be there and you can say to anyone on the planet you will be there adam will be there eve will be there what do you think they will think they will see millions and millions and millions and millions of people who are all their descendants for the very first time the whole human race will be assembled in one place and adam and eve will will see the extent of the ruin which came upon the human race because of their sin i wonder what will go through their mind the people who lived before the flood every imagination of their thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually uh, they will be there and that bright star which shone in that dark night enoch <laughs> he will be there the patriarchs will be there won't they abraham isaac and jacob and joseph and moses and all the people who lived in canaan joshua and gideon and deborah and david and the cruel assyrians will be there who took it, northern israel away to their exile and nebuchadnezzar will be there and the babylonians and cyrus and the P the medes and the persians and alexander the great and the greeks and the romans and uh, all the national leaders of all times so president biden will be there lee sin lung will be there our prime minister boris johnson will be there and all the great characters of history will be there biblical characters cain the first murderer who killed his brother abel pharaoh who hardened his heart against god herod who tried to kill the infant christ judas who betrayed jesus with a kiss demas who threw off not only christian work but the christian faith because he loved this world more they will be there confucius buddha muhammad and every pope and the men and the women and the boys and girls of every generation of every age of every nationality whatever their economic status rich or poor whatever their education whatever their language whatever their culture whatever their people group the verse is clear we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ 
And I think that most of us aren't looking at history properly, that history, as Calvin put it, is accelerating. And it's accelerating towards that great day where the whole human race, Christian and non-Christian, will give an answer to Jesus Christ. Which brings me to the second point. You will be there. Christ will be there. Jesus of Nazareth, they called him. They won't be saying that then. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews, said Pontius Pilate, and put it on the placard over the cross. I wonder what he'll be thinking. And Jesus will be there as a judge. And Jesus will be there as the only judge. Uh, sometimes in courts, we have a panel of judges. But we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When you think of Christ, you must always think of four numbers. One, two, two, three. One person, there's a, two natures, he's 100% God and he's 100% man. Two estates, he came amongst us in a state of humiliation, but he's now in a state of exaltation. Three offices, prophet, priest, and king. And before this one person, this God man, this humiliated but now exalted prophet, priest, and king, we will all appear. You will be there. Christ will be there. It's interesting, isn't it? The human race will be judged by a human. The one who was judged will judge. The one who is still judged, because everybody has an opinion about him, will judge. And he will give every one of us a fair trial. There is no piece of evidence in your favor which will be overlooked. And there's no piece of evidence which is against you, which will be overlooked. This last judgment will be completely different from the judgments that we experience on earth. Um, you know, and I know that there are certain people who are not judged fairly in court. There are people who are very guilty of a great deal, but they, they get away with it. There are dictators and royalty and privileged people, influential people, uh, powerful people, rich people, celebrities. Often the, the, they don't receive the justice which they deserve to receive. And then often then there are other people who are poor and uninfluential and neglected and of no consequence who are not treated fairly either. But this judgment is going to be completely different because there will be a fair trial because there will be a full trial. Uh, let's say that you live for 70 years. How long will it take to judge you? Let's say the Lord decides to replay your life in real time. So you've lived for 70 years. And now your judgment lasts 70 years so that no detail is, is omitted. There's plenty of time, you see, isn't there? This is eternity now. It, it doesn't matter if the Lord plays every single life in, in real time. Because we're in eternity now. For the first time ever, there will be a fair trial because there will be a full trial. You will be there. 
Christ will be there. And number three, the record of your actions will be there. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So you and I will be judged not by what we say about ourselves. We won't be judged by our profession. We'll be judged by our actions. Everything you've ever done during your life in the body will be known, even if it was done in secret. Jesus declares that everything that you've ever done will be shouted from the, from the rooftops. Everything you've done and everything you've not done, which you should have done because you were doing something else, it will be known. And so we come back to double imputation. Because frankly, if it wasn't for double imputation, we would all be in despair listening to a message like this. Nothing about me will be hidden from you. And nothing about you will be hidden from me. It will all be on public display. And if it wasn't for double imputation by the grace of God, we would be in considerable distress now. But when you hear all about my sins, and when we hear about your sins, we believers will rejoice because it will be seen just how great the sacrifice was that Christ made and how extraordinary the work when he took those sins, yes, even those sins in his own body on the tree. And then when we see how little righteousness we've got, which is, of course, none at all, because even our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We'll, be see, we'll see then, like we've never seen before, how wonderful the, the life of Christ was and is, because it's, it's that righteousness which is put to our account. We will have an appreciation of the gospel at the last judgment, which we can never possibly ever have in this life. So why is the Lord going to judge our actions? Because our actions are the evidence, the proof of what we really are. So maybe you're a professing Christian, but you lie and you cheat and you nurse and nourish thoughts which are despicably ungodly. Well, that last judgment will show that you're nothing but a fake. But maybe you're someone who really does love the Lord Jesus Christ. And your heart goes out to him. And you, you seek, you really do seek to live like him. Well, that's another matter altogether. That's what will be seen. But it's actions that are considered at the last day. It's actions, actions, which will be produced in court. You will be there. Christ will be there, and the record of your actions will be there. And now we come to the fourth point. Your eternal destiny will start there. At the final judgment, you'll be either condemned or acquitted. And according to the verdict, you will receive the things you have done in your body. Now, this is, this is an expression which we really need to consider and is very often overlooked. Believers, you will be rewarded, not because you deserve it, not because I deserve it, but because as always, it's the gift of God's grace. The Lord gave you grace to believe. The Lord gave you a new heart. Out of that new heart has flowed good works. 
the Lord gave you that heart and he's given you those good works. And now he considers those good works to be the evidence and the proof that you have a new heart. So you love your wife. You love your husband. You're tender with your family and yet firm. You're faithful to your church. You're kind to your neighbors. You're considerate to your colleagues. You're generous to the wider world. You use your money to support the Lord's work, but also to help the poor. You work in the church. You witness privately. You have a life of prayer. You encourage young Christians. You open your home to hospitality. You visit the lonely. You supply for the needy. You're tender with the vulnerable. And the Lord will look at all that and he'll take a crown and he'll put it on your head. And what you will do is you'll take it off and you'll throw it down at his feet. But you will receive from him the things done in the body. But what about those of you who are unconverted? Well, you're listening to me in the context of the ministry of Shalom, Reformed Baptist Church in Singapore, which shows straight away you've probably got more light than most other people. You've got family members, perhaps, or close friends who are Christians. You've been to church services in Shalom. You live in Singapore, where there's still a good measure of personal liberty. And you've sinned against it. You've not, you've not come to believe. Well, Scripture is quite plain here. You will receive a greater condemnation. Let's think about what Paul is saying. Listen to it again. Each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. You will receive the things done in the body. You've loved darkness rather than light. So the Lord will say to you at the judgment, all right, that's what you will receive. You've loved darkness, you will have darkness, not light. You've loved a life where, from which God is absent. That's what you've done in the body. So the Lord will say to you, all right, you want a life where God is absent. That's what you will have. For eternity, you will have a life from which I am absent. Even my image will be absent from you. So the very image of God, which restrains the sins of unconverted people, I'll take that away too. And there'll be nothing left except what is ungodly and satanic. You've lied. All right, says the Lord, you've lied. You've spent a life lying. Then that's all you will be able to do throughout eternity. You will do nothing but tell lies. Every time you open your mouth, you will speak lies. You wanted a week without a Sabbath. All right, says God, you will have an eternity without a Sabbath. You will have an eternity without any rest, whatever. You've cultivated dirty thoughts. All right, says the Lord, that's what you've done in the body. Then that's what you will have throughout all eternity. That's what you will think. You will think polluted, dirty, ungodly, awful things. That's what your thought processes will be throughout eternity. You've nourished and you've nursed envy. All right, says the Lord. That's the sort of person you will be forevermore, filled with envy, filled with malice. And you can see immediately that that is hell. That's what Paul is saying. And that's presumably why God has brought you to hear this message. Because you're not in hell yet. 
you're hearing a message which is warning you and speaking to you about the final judgment, which is showing to you the wonder of the gospel and double imputation, and that no sinner needs to perish, and that's not what God wants. But for those who will not repent and will not come to Christ, he will give he will give you what you want. He will, he will look at the deeds done in the body, and that's what he will give you for all eternity. And it will be hell. But you're not in hell yet. God's very kind, you know. And in his kindness, he's brought you to hear a message like this and to think about the future. When I was a boy, I read these words. Oh, come to the merciful Savior who calls you. Oh, come to the Lord who forgives and forgets. Though dark be the fortune on earth which befalls you, there's a bright home above where the sun never sets. Come. Come to his feet and lay open your story of sorrow and suffering, of guilt and of shame. For the pardon of sin is the crown of his glory and the joy of the Lord to be true to his name. And as a boy, I thought, what does it mean to be true to his name? It's obvious, isn't it? What did the angel say? You shall call his name Jesus, which means savior. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then I understood the words which I had read. Oh, come to the merciful Savior who calls you. Oh, come to the Lord who forgives and forgets. Thank you for listening to these four messages on being future ready for failure, for temptation. Be ready also for the second coming and for the final judgment. God bless you all. Thank you.